Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's episode of It's All About the Questions, and as always, it is my favorite, favorite, favorite time of the week to be here with you, bringing you amazing guests and treating you and me to the opportunity to meet some amazing people that I've met along the way of my life that have really helped me rethink how I think about life. And today's guest is no different in that he's somebody that along the way I met and I was like, oh my God, he helped script the soundtrack of my life, and I'm so excited that Tom Baylor, Tom Baylor, sorry about that, Tommy, <laughs> has agreed <laughs> to be on the show today. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking a break from all of your travels to be here with me. Well, it's a pleasure being here with you, Laura. Thank you. I remember when we first met at Author 101, and Rick Frischman introduced me to you, and he's like, this is somebody you should know. <laughs> And I went, okay, and then you and I first started talking, and the thing that blew me away was your energy. I mean, and it wasn't like, you know, you have this vibrant, happy energy, which you do. It was like this this feeling from you of, I'm here, this is what I do, I want to make a difference in your life. It was like you spark something in the people that come in, to contact with you. Are you aware of that or it, it just sort of is just part of who you are? I, um, I would say it's probably who I am. I know I love people and, uh, and I was raised, uh, by my parents and especially on my father's side. There's a, a long line of bailers that go back to Switzerland. We have records of us since 1528. <laughs> so wow. we kind of, we sort of see trends in the family, but yeah, I don't think our, I think that our, I would say that our philosophy was probably pretty much the same as everybody else's, but it was stated a lot. And that's that we're all here to serve others. That's why we're on this earth. Every one of us. And, and, and my father said that, you know, I think when we serve others from our passion, we serve them as best we can because I have yet to meet someone who has a passion who isn't good at it. Yet for so many people finding their passion and act, like knowing their passion and then turning it into something that starts changing other people's lives is not something that often happens. Now, I mean, Tommy, you've been part of the American music world since, gosh, since the 60s. I mean, you worked with mm-hmm. Dan and Dean, you worked with Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, the Parfish family, Barbara Streisand, Elvis, my huge crush, Bobby Sherman, way back when. And <laughs> I, I such a huge crush. I remember all my A-track tapes with Bobby Sherman. And then finding out after I met you that you wrote all these songs that were literally the soundtrack of my life. Oh, well, it was a fun, it was a fun era. I happened to be, my brother and I landed in the golden age of, uh, of our industry in terms of records, television, commercials, movies, uh, in terms of the type of music that we were doing. And, uh, and it's wonderful to be in the right place at the right time with the right talent to, to be able to serve that. So it was, it's been a joy. I'm very grateful for my life. Well, you know, you said be the right time at the right place with the, the right what you're doing. But when I was reading through on the web whatever I could find on you, it really seems like Part of you planned where you were going, but not really. It it was like you were open to the possibility of where you wanted a career to go, but it unfolded a lot because of your brother, John. Would that be um, a good 
description of how this path that you took that has changed the world with music happened? I don't think that we had a path, quite frankly, but we had a, <clears throat> again, this goes back to our upbringing. Uh, we, we were raised, again, with, if you have something to do, give it your best from beginning to end. Okay. Just give it your best. And, and the rest of it, you don't, uh, we were also raised with a good concept of what we control and what we don't. And, and what I learned that I control is my, um, is my intent and using the qualities that I've been given to invest in whatever I do, whether it's teaching my son to throw a ball, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, working out a vocal arrangement with Barbara Streisand, you know? It's really kind of the same thing, and, and um, so we were prepared. Uh, the, the one thing that we were raised with is we weren't allowed to say, I can't. My dad would say, I'd say, I can't, Dad, and he'd say, well, I have a different view of that. <laughs> Say, yeah, what is that? He'd say, well, uh, uh, we, we don't use that word in our family. And, and it's not that you can't. Uh, it's not that you haven't done it yet. But when you walk, you probably don't remember this, but when you started walking at nine months, you fell down a lot. If you were conscious, you might have thought, well, I guess I can't walk, so I'm just going to sit here. But, of course, we know that that's not what we do. So we fall down, we laugh, we get up, we pretty soon we're running, you know, and we've kind of applied that philosophy to everything that we come across is that the first time you throw a ball, don't expect to be good at it. But if you keep doing it pretty soon, you get good, you know, and I love the way I was raised because my dad in 45 years, I had him on this planet, never told me what to do, not once. I was raised with questions and suggestions. And that well, was you, wonderful you know to wake up. I questions, so I love that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <clears throat> and the thing was that as a little kid, my brother and I are quite different. My brother is older, two and a half years. John. John is an observer. Uh, maybe, I don't know if this is this way with most first children, but he didn't ask questions. He observed and then he would go for something. For me, being a little brother, I guess, I'd say, how do you do that? Why are you doing that? How do you do that? Why are you doing that? And to the point that uh, I was annoying to some people, but not my dad. My dad, any time I asked my dad a question, well, first of all, he would never answer it. <laughs> how do you do that? He'd say, how do you think you do it? I go, okay, here we go again. <laughs> I don't know, Dad. If I knew, I wouldn't ask you. And he said, but if you did know. So that was his way of exciting and putting into use our powers of observation. You want a little story, a little story about that when I, I was five? I, I, would, I would absolutely love that because that just reminds me of my parents where I'd ask them a question and they'd go, well, let's go to the library and see if we can find the answer. Or you have to ask three other people that you don't know to get an answer. So I'd love to hear Exactly. Your well, and, I, and I love the subject one because for me, I think one of the reasons I'm a pretty happy person. I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm so happy is that I was guided to discovery. My father never told me what to do because that would be his opinion. But by guiding me to discovery, I discovered it for myself. And, and, and this is why I'm such an Aesop lover. You know, I wrote a book about him and I, my life is, Aesop is my hero. And if you don't know who Aesop is, uh, A-E-S-O-P, but his real, his Greek name is Esopu. Uh, and, uh, but he wrote the fables. And in the fables, stories like uh, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, you know, that we learn about, everybody knows those stories, whether they know who Aesop is or not. 
and they've been around for 2,600 years. But what he did in his stories is guide us to discovery, because in his stories, we discover the meaning of it. Instead of somebody saying, here, two and two equals four. Right? Right. But if you put if you put four pencils on the table and separated them and said, how many pencils are on the left, Tommy? And I'd say two. How many pencils are on the right? Two. Okay, if you put those together, how many are there? One, two, three, four. Wow, I discovered that. Instead of saying two and two is four. I'm laughing because I never thought of it that way. (laughs) Well, well, that's the way I was raised. So here's a little story. When I was five years old, <clears throat> excuse me, having a big brother, I learned how to ride a two-wheeler pretty early. And I come out one Saturday morning, and the tire's flat on my, on my bike. So I go into my dad, and Saturdays were, were the one day he liked to sleep in. But, of course, I'm five. Dad, wake up. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I said... My tire's flat on my back. And he looks at me with one eye open, and he says, what do you want? And I thought I annoyed him. But this is how incredible this guy was. I said, oh, I'm sorry. And he gets out of bed. As soon as he sees my, the look on my face, he gets out of bed on his haunches, so he's looking right into my five-year-old eyes. And he said, listen to my words. What do you want? I said, I want my tire not to be flat. He said, great. How are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, let's go outside. So we go look at the bike. And he says, "Uh, okay, yeah, you're right. Your tire's flat. What are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. And he said, but if you did know. So now that's my cue to use my power of observation. I look at him. The tire's, you know, obviously not full of air, and I said, well, I guess that tire has to come off the wheel, and he says, great, how are you going to do that? And I'm like, oh, man. (laughs) So I said, well, I, so now I look down at the, where the wheel is attached, and there are two nuts there, you know, I said, I guess those nuts have to come off. He says, great, I'll get you a wrench. So he brings me a wrench, and he goes, look, you're five, I'll loosen it for you. So he loosens them, and then he stands back and looks at me with a smile on his face. And so I take the nuts off, and now there's a lock washer, and there's a flat washer on each side. And I look at all these parts, and I'm a little kid. And I said, Dad, I don't know what I'm going to do with all these parts. And he said, I have a suggestion. I said, okay. He said, you're two feet away from a wall. If I were doing this, I would take the nuts off, put them next to the wall. The lock washer is next to the nuts, but toward me. The flat washer is next to the lock washers toward me. And let's keep the parts that you chop, just keep putting them toward you. And then we'll fix the flat. And after we fix the flat, start off with the pieces toward that are closest to you. Work your way back to the wall. <clears throat> Five years old. And I did it. It was so simple, and it made so much sense. And he was present. That was the thing. My parents were, and I imagine yours were too, my parents were very present with me. They, he didn't say, oh, you'll figure it out, you know, and leave me alone. No, he was there with me. So it was actually better than being told what to do because he was, I felt safe. I felt, um, I felt. Uh, supported. Venerated. Yeah. Yeah, supported. And, and yet he'd never answer a damn question. Never. In my whole life. And it got to be a joke. <laughs> uh, but in a nutshell, that's what prepared me to work in our business. Because when I love music, Dad played in the studio. So he was a hell of a trumpet player. He was self-taught. Raised in a little tiny town, Willow Springs, Missouri. And... Uh, but learn how to play the trumpet on his own and uh, went on the road when he was 16, came out to California, started a band, yada, yada, yada. He ended up playing in the studios. He played for RKO, Paramount, Fox, and MGM. And um, that was his business, was being a trumpet player. And he loved it. And then when the war started, 
uh, Second World War, he wanted to join the army, but somehow his he had a problem with his stomach, and they wore F'd him, and it was very upsetting to him. So he got involved because he was working with people in the industry. Uh, his next door neighbor worked at Cal Shipyard, which was going 24 hours a day building ships, and he brought in talent to <clears throat> entertain them during their lunch hour. And that way he got involved. So again, if you remember what I said about serving others, you know, right. he was serving others. And after the war ended, <clears throat> he and my grandfather, because dad was taking care of all the equipment, he was a one man show. So he was producing it. He was, uh, back then, you know, tubes would go out on an amplifier and things were not, they didn't work every time we turn them on like our iPhones today, you know? Well, they and, don't always work all the time either, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I made a very and, successful career of fixing technology for over 30 years, so. <laughs> mm. Yes. You so can't run from it somehow Mr. in these and days. All those things. Well, so, and, and my brother and I wanted to play trumpet because we saw the passion in his eyes when he played, because he would play in the living room. And just uh, and he also played cello and he actually played in the studios on cello too. All of this was self-taught. But then, before we were born in the '30s, he had gone back to New York to play in the Roxy Theater circuit, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, he decided to go to Juilliard to study with a very famous trumpet teacher there. And uh, when he went to when he went to audition for him, the guy said, I'll take you, but as long as you're free during the days, why don't you just go to school here? So dad was self-taught and went, ended up going to Juilliard. So he had both street sense and an academic sense. <clears throat> Excuse it me. really sounds like your dad's journey and the way he was with you and your brother really set up this sort of fearlessness that, I see when I look over your career in in music yes. with the people that you worked with, where how you were able to go, okay, um, doing stuff with Andy Williams, but no, I'm ready to leave there and go somewhere else just so I free things up. I'm doing a season with the Smothers Brothers, but no, that's going to limit me, so it's time to go. I need to serve a bigger audience. I need to go further. Would you agree with that assessment, Tommy? Well, I agree with what happened, <clears throat> but I didn't have those thoughts. Okay. They were I just sort of behind there. I answered the phone. From the time it started when I was 13, you know, when you're going in the seventh grade and you're having dances where you're not being regulated, you know what I mean? Yes. So, and, and you're at that age where you want to hug and kiss a girl and... You can either do that in the movies or something, but there wasn't many places where you could, where you could hold somebody's hand or, you know, and I had a big crush on Martha Mutz and she kind of liked me too. And I was looking forward to our very first seventh grade dance, which was done at Darby park, which was a city park. And yes, there were adults there, but it, you know, it was really the time when we got to be ourselves. And the only way I could really hold Marty the way I wanted to, that was her nickname, okay. um, uh, was to dance with her. And I wanted the slow, I mean, I like fast dancing, but I love slow dancing because then you have your arms around each other. And uh, the band that was there were playing music that my father wouldn't dance to. So my buddies, <clears throat> excuse me, my buddies said, hey, Baylor, go tell them what we want to hear. So I went up to the band guy and I said, hey, would you please play these songs? And the guy says, we don't play that crap. So it was very disappointing. And, and the other, another tenet of our philosophy we were raised with is when you're dissatisfied, you... My dad always gave me the I message. So again, he wasn't telling me what he said. So when I'm dissatisfied, I ask myself, what do I want? 
And it's a powerful question. So, and because I'm steeped in this, I'm already prepared. So I'm not afraid, but I'm also 13 years old, and I'm not talking to that many adults other than my family and friends. And the guy that's running it is probably 22 or something. He's a really nice guy. And so I didn't know when the band leader was so rude to me, I decided to, what do I want? I want to dance with Marty. How are you going to, what are you going to do about it? Well, go find the guys who hired these guys. So I found out who he was. I went and stood next to him because I didn't have the nerve to talk to him. I just stood next to him. And finally, he noticed me, and he said, are you having a good time? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. And if you look at the dance floor, you'll probably see that none of us are. And he said, wow, you're right. There's nobody on the dance floor. And uh, I didn't want to bring him a problem. I wanted to bring him a solution. So I said, I have an idea. The next dance that you have that you haven't booked a band for, I'll bring in a band of the kind of quality that you have here that will play our songs and we'll do the first job pro bono. Well, it wasn't pro bono there. It was, we'll do the first job on the house. And you were 13. And the, yeah. But see, I was there to serve. But, but that was serving myself because I wanted to dance with my girl. Right. So part That's of why serving is serving yourself as well. I mean, if, you, if you're only serving others and not serving yourself, then you become quickly so exhausted that you can't function. I quite, I couldn't agree more. So to me, it's a balance. So yeah, the guy, now the fun, so the guy took me into his office on a break and he said, here's a date. Can you make that? And I said, yeah. The only thing is I didn't have a band. <laughs> Leave it to Tommy. Still living that life today. <laughs> but. I had a lot of buddies who played, you know what I mean? I, it wasn't hard to put together a quartet, you know, four guys. And so I called him up and I said, here, I'm sending you a set list. And, and by that time, we didn't, you had to copy it down while we're talking on the phone. Here's the set list, four hours. And here's the set list. Can you play these songs? Of course. So I put the band together. We came in. The our, our friends were all dancing. I got to dance with Martha, and it was a beautiful night. And the next thing I knew, I got a call. That was from Monroe Junior High in Inglewood. Then I got a call from Crozier. And they said, hey, we heard you have a great band. Would you play for our dance? Well, it was the same night, and I only had one band, but so I put together another band. It wasn't that hard, you know, because, again, I know these, these are all my friends. So within six months, I had four different bands. And all of a sudden, I was like a band maven. But that wasn't why I was a band maven. I was there so I could hold my girlfriend. Well, let me take a step but back I, there because Tony, but I you said the, it wasn't that okay, hard. But for a lot of people, that is hard. They, they know they want to do something, but they're not able to put all those pieces together as well as you so eloquently, so easily, so readily were able to put together these multiple bands. So well, because I was, I concentrate on possibilities, not how difficult something's going to be. Got it. And that's the title of your book that I absolutely adored, Anything is Possible, A Tale of Aesop. Yes. Yes. And then the other book that I wrote, which is called What You Want Wants You, <clears throat> is really a book about our family philosophy. And this started in our life with my grandmother. And that was what, what you, and she used to say, what you want, want you. We are energetic beings, and when an energy comes to us, gives us an idea, that idea ha has a reason for it. Okay, and with that, we're going to head out into the national news. I love that. What you want, want you. Grandmas are so smart, aren't they? They just have this wisdom. The best. That, that is there for our whole lives. All right, everybody, we are going to be coming back with Tommy Baylor. Um, just a man that has probably soundtracked your life as well as mine, and we're going to be asking him a lot more questions about music, life, and possibilities. Welcome back, everybody. If you missed the first half of the show because you were listening to us live currently on iHeartRadio, W-A-X-E, then you're going to want to catch this on podcast anywhere your favorite podcast platform is, whether it be on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, 
iHeart, anywhere that you can get a podcast, this show is available around the world. So you won't want to miss this first half. I am here with the amazing, amazing Tommy Baylor, who, um, Tommy, I mean, you've been, you shared on the first half of the show the setup of your life, which to me really explains to people, to entrepreneurs especially, I have a lot of listeners that are entrepreneurs, this idea of the power of questions, right? The idea that don't just get an answer. You need to search. You need to learn. You need to try. You need to change the way you're thinking and let go of the fear around the possible way of doing something. And that seems to be the soundtrack of your life from the way your dad and your, and your mom really taught you is that you can do anything you want as long as you're looking to serve others as well as yourself. I want to thank you. Very well said, Laura. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, that's the way my parents taught me as well. And I mm-hmm. think that's why when I met you that first time at Author 101, when Rick introduced us, Rick Frischman, why I felt so connected to you, so attracted to you in, in a way of an energy attraction that, wow, this man is real. I've met many people that I've had, um, you know, throughout my life that I'm like, oh, I, I love the work that this person does, and then I meet them, and I find out they're they're not who their public persona is in private. But you, on the other hand, are are the same, whether you're in public or you're in private. And I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, and. Yeah, I'm. I would say that's a good description. I agree with that. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you do, and I, I bet your dad would be very proud of that as well. Yeah, my dad was. Well, both my parents. I was lucky, you know. I mean, but it's. Yeah, it was great. So. Uh, now you, you probably want to and- talk about some of the folks I've worked with because yeah. I've had the joy of working with some of the best people on the planet. And I want to talk about that because, you know, you are so much more than just the music that you've written and the people that you've worked with. But music for really the world can heal the world. And Mm -hmm. you were involved with a project that I really remember so much in my life called We Are the World. Yes, sir. And yes, I remember ma'am. when that song came out, thinking, this is the first time I've seen the world really come together for something. What is it about music that can change the way the world thinks? Well, music is the universal language for a reason, because it's, uh, it doesn't depend on culture language, background, abilities. We can listen to music and enjoy it without understanding how it works. We can, because music speaks to our soul, to our heart, to our being. And, and that's the power of it. And, and it was a thrill to be involved with We Are The World because Bob Geldof had a great idea to raise money. You know, people were starving in, in Ethiopia. There was a huge famine. And, and he's a generous spirit and put together a group of people in England. And they wrote a song, and it was great, and it sold 8 million records in two weeks or something. And, but it <laughs> unfortunately had a very limited shelf life. And that's where he realized they made a mistake because the name of the tune was Do They Know It's Christmas? And as good a song as that was, it wasn't going to play in March. So he came to America because you realized he had a, a, a successful idea. Came to the States and called, because Bob Geldof's an activist. I, sometimes that word scares me because it's, it sounds extreme, but he's not. He's a beautiful man who is an activist within a, within a range that all of us, I think, can enjoy. 
And and so was Harry Belafonte. So he came and called Harry Belafonte and says, "Hey, man, we we did it and we blew it. <laughs> you know, I want to do it in the big pond over here in America, and uh, where instead of sixty million people, you have three hundred million, and um, and and hit and Harry." is a great performer and a beautiful man. And he was thinking, well, you know, let's do a concert. Well, a concert, when it's, it's over, it's over. So, but luckily he called Ken Cragen, who was this beautiful man, a good friend of mine for years, who was a great manager and a great organizer. And he said to Harry, hey, you know what? What we need to do is write a new song and get some of my the people in my stable. He had Lionel Richie and... Kenny Rogers and oh my gosh, it, it was a who's who, and and he went to Lionel and Lionel wrote a song called "We Are the World" and then he called Quincy because his, in his idea and I agree, Quincy was the best producer on the planet, and Quincy listened to the song. He said, "I love this song," and he was producing Michael. He said, "I'd love for Michael to kiss this," so Michael and he finished the song, and then we put this group together of stars because we already had that pattern from Bob Geldof. And the song, we made sure that the song was universal and it wasn't tied to a time period, you know, because it would be like if we would have done it about Easter, we would have been in the same trouble. Right, and so, the song still holds up. Exactly, it still does, because it is quite universal. It's universal in spirit, it's universal melodically, and the whole thing. And that was really our idea, is that let's find a song that means something to us personally, and it'll mean something to people all over the world. And and Lionel and, and Michael killed it, you know? And uh, and because I a lot of my work has been in a vocal arranging, uh, the... Uh, Quincy asked me to to be the associate producer and the vocal arranger on it. So, and and my direction was from him. He said, "I only have two directions. One one is that Lionel wrote it first. He was the first one to start the song. So I would like for him to sing the first line. And Michael finished the song and let him have him sing the first chorus. And then because he and Michael." I mean, because Michael and Diana were so close, and so like Diana was like a mom or an aunt or something to him. But uh, I mean, they have a beautiful relationship. I'd like for her to sing on the first chorus too. That all made perfect sense, historically and and energetically. So that's what we did. And he said, Ev- everything after that is yours. And I got a list of artists who were going to be on, and I had worked with a lot of them. And then I had albums to listen to for their style for their vocal range. And I've been asked so many questions. Wasn't it difficult to, to you know, pick these singers? And my answer is no, because as I said in the first half, I was raised on what is possible here, not about what can go wrong. Because to me, I'm spending my, if I'm worried about something going wrong, I'm spending my energy on the wrong thing. But here I was, vocal arranging in heaven, Almost, you know, right. I've got, look at their 40 major stars there. Well, I didn't have to think I let it happen. And I heard each one of those people come in their time. I didn't think about it. I finished that arrangement maybe in an hour because I knew it was going to start. I might've been in a quandary if Quincy hadn't said start with Lionel, you know? Who am I going to start with? Well, he gave me that. And I knew who was going to sing the first chorus. But then, you know, I had so many different artists, and I just heard them come in and do it. And and uh, especially in the second time through the chorus, I heard the boss come in. We yeah. are the world. You know? I remember that. I mean, that. it was just so there. And then and then you have Steve Fair, there's a choice we're making. You know? <laughs> you know? Uh, the, they're, they just sang to me. So it was a piece of cake. It was honestly a piece of cake. But maybe that's the way I was trained, and I'm so used to doing that 
when I walk into a situation, I don't think, oh, my God, what am I doing here? I'm not qualified. I felt qualified for everything I've ever done because I'm a human being who loves others, and so are they. So let's work together. Do you think it would be possible, well, obviously, since anything is possible for you, to do something on the level of we are the world today in 2019? No, because it's been done. Okay. So you they, don't tried to, they, tr they tried to do it again, and we get requests for this all the time. The closest thing that I ever did to it was in a movie called Wag the Dog, which uh, I love this movie that was written by David Mamet. And, you appeared and, in that, uh, didn't you? Well, yeah, I wrote the song. I wrote the, the, I wrote the anthem that was in it because... In it, they wanted an anthem like We Are the World, you know? But and and but the song was a ruse, because, you know, it's a dark comedy. That was a great and, movie. And it, it, was, it was a great movie. I loved the movie. And when when uh, the director sent me the... Barry Levinson. When Barry sent me the... Uh, I was on vacation with my family. And uh, he called and said, uh, Quincy Jones said, you're the anthem king. Would you write this for us? And I said, well, send me the script and let me look at it. He said, David Mamet wrote it. And I said, well, I know I'm going to love it already. Let me take a look at it. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, I totally am on to it. But for me, I think for this song to be funny and to be ironic like you want it to be, I've got to write it seriously. I can't write this as a joke. I need to write this as if my heart is completely involved in it. And he said, that's exactly what I want. So I went to the, I went to the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and Constitution because the song is called The American Dream. And uh, that's what came to me. It was that, you know, what we're trying to do is guard our American dream. So it, again, it was a process. And once I have the tools to start, just like my dad giving me that wrench, you know, once you have the tools, you just do it one piece at a time. You put the nut next to the wall and the lock washer next to it. And that's been kind of the building blocks of my life. And it was so much fun to write that song. I, I loved it. Barry loved it. We had a great recording of it. We, we, you know, anyway, it just worked beautifully. So that's the closest thing I've ever done to We Are the World. Now, they did We Are the World for for uh, one, Haiti, they did it again like 25 years later. Quincy did not want to do it because he felt like it too. This is a one-off thing. Once you've done something that is that extraordinary, you can't redo it. You can't do it again. Well, they did it again, and yes, it sold a lot because the fervor was to help them Nobody ever plays that recording. Now, I can't say no one, but it's rarely played, even though it was done with great stars, great everything, but we've done it. And that takes me back to when I thought I had competition when I first went to USC, and okay. I was a great trumpet player because I had the right training, I had the passion for it, and I was always the best trumpet player wherever I was, and I was used to that. And I never thought of myself about being the best. I just felt very qualified. And when I went to see, there are three other guys who play as well as I do. And I came home and my dad said, how was it? How was it? How are the players at SC? I said, oh, dad, I have competition. And he said, son, I suggest you stop right there. And I said, what are you talking about? Ronnie Rom can play this and Mario Canary can do this. And Tommy Stevens never made a mistake. And he said, yeah, and I bet they're home talking to their kids about it, too. They're, I bet they're talk, talking to their dad about you. And he said, son, you have no competition. There's never been a Tommy Baylor. There will never be another Tommy Baylor. You're the only one. There are 100 billion people who have walked on this planet, and no two are alike. And that gave me clarity and confidence in he said, I believe as long as we are following our passion and we do what we believe in, that we have no competition. So that freed me of ever feeling like I wasn't good enough because I didn't have to compare myself to someone else. I can't be Bobby Sherman. I can't be Michael Jackson. But they can't be Tommy Bailey either. 
<laughs> no. at, at the same time, Tommy, they couldn't have been Bobby Sherman, Michael Jackson, Cher, all these other people without you because you wrote these songs that they performed that defined their sound. So without well, their Tommy sound Miller, was there. I, I would, I, I would, I would, I would, I have another opinion about that because. No, uh, an artist became an artist because they were doing what they loved. Elvis Absolutely. did it. Absolutely. Elvis was just a country boy who sang what he felt, sang through his heart. I had the pleasure of working with him. One of the most real human beings I've ever met in my life. I say the same thing about Cher. Cher is what you see is what you get. She's a marvelous woman who also believed in herself but when she was 16 and got with Sonny she did what he told her to do because she was still a kid but then <laughs> got to the point where hey Sonny you know we're an equal partnership here and somehow that didn't work so they became friends instead but you know what I'm saying is that I didn't shape them what I did was was tune in to who they were and write something that I wanted to hear him sing. And luckily, they wanted to hear it too. That's that all about service. It, it's, I'm it, sorry? I said that's also all about service, which is about who you are, Tommy. And, and I love exactly. the way you put that about you love these people and their sound and what they were doing. So you wrote something for them. That, that I heard them sing in that my head. Yeah. them. Yeah. For years, Cher told me that Living in a House Divided was her favorite song. It wasn't her biggest hit. It was a hit. But, you know, of Gypsy, Tramps, and Thieves, and all sorts, you know, other songs. A lot of times, artists don't really love the songs they're doing, but they know that it's going to work. And that's cool. But, uh, and, and with Michael, the first time Michael heard She's Out of My Life, he called it the single. Quincy hadn't even produced him yet, and he called it the single. Well, it was one of four singles that came off on that album. And, uh, and with Bobby Sherman, that was my first hit. And the way that that came about is that I had luckily stepped into a situation with Ford Motor Company, my brother and I, where they were looking for a group to represent them. And, uh, and we got the gig, and, and we made my income grew by eight, uh, by a factor of eight the next year. I did well in my first year in the business. I was on the Smother Show, and I loved it, and the money was good, and, and, and again, I was at home where I was, I felt like I belonged there, and then, but over the summer, I got so many calls to do record dates, so when the show started up the next year, I couldn't do it any longer. And when I called the guy who hired me, to tell him I wasn't coming back, he was upset. And I said, well, I'm sorry to upset you, but I have someone to replace me who is, uh, quite frankly, in my belief, better than I was. And it turned out that that was, he was better for the show. So to me, because I love people, I didn't want to burn bridges. I just didn't leave the show. I replaced myself. So... I guess it's just a, a continuity of energy, of positive energy moving through things. And so, like for Bobby Sherman, um, that was 1970. I started in 67. By 1970, we were known within the industry because we had a certain sound and we had energy and we sang a lot of hits. And when we first sang for Bobby on Little Woman, Hey, Little Woman, you know, yeah. his first song he recorded, it was like we were the stars, the background singers. He was there for the background part. And he says, oh, thank you for singing on my record, man. You guys have done so much stuff. And I'm so glad. I thought, what a beautiful kid he is. And I love the way he sang. And, and we did his whole first album with him. And then uh, the sec we started to do the second and by this time, and we were friends with all the producers too. And Jackie Mills was his producer. And he came in one day and he says, Hey, you guys are singing all over town. There's a real dearth of songs for Bobby because he's, you know, he's in this certain bracket. It's like preteen girls, right? It's bubblegum, what they call bubblegum. And, but they need to be sincere and yada, yada. And, and, uh, 
he said, so if you hear some songs, and my brother said, oh, have Tom write you a song. And I'm going, no, 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 because I vote for girls. But I vote for my heart, and most of them were probably as sophisticated as I was, which wasn't really teeny bopper music. So I, I played a song for Jackie, and he said, I love the way you write. Uh, I need something that's right for Bobby. And I said, well, I'm not sure I know how to do that. And he gave me the clue. He said, okay, put yourself back to when you were 16, when you stood by your locker room four times a day just to wait for her to walk by. Oh, we were all there. <laughs> See, exactly. He, he's the one who ignited that energy. And I went, Julie Luthi. I was in love with Julie Luthi. She was a year younger than me. She was the queen of the clique. And, you know, most of the cliques the girls had were the, usually the queen was kind of a, a bitch, you know? Yes. <laughs> Sorry to, I mean. One of the mean girls. Julie was not. Awesome. Julie was a sweetheart. She was kind. She was gorgeous. She was just everything, and I was in love with her, but I didn't stand a chance with her because she was 16, but going out with a guy who was 26, his name was Dewey Weber. He was the first surfboard king in Southern California. And uh, so I didn't stand a chance with her, but she was always so nice to me. And I, besides, I'd known her since I was eight. So anyway, that's where Julie Do You Love Me came. So it really has nothing and, to do with Bobby Sherman or a girl that he loved. It was all about you, but it resonated with him because he had his own dream. Absolutely. That's right, because when you listen to the song, it's, you know, it says, uh, being alone at night makes me sad, girl. Yeah, it brings me down all right. Tossing and turning and freezing and burning and crying all through the night. Julie, 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 do you love me? I mean, it's real simple. You know, and then it's a narrative. It talks about, so you set it up in the first or second verse is, uh, we had so much fun together and I was sure that you were mine, but leaving you, baby, is driving me crazy. It's got me wondering all the time, Julie, do you love me? So that's, now we take the story to another level. And the third one, it says, the third verse is, honey, I cried, the, honey, you cried the day I left you, even though you knew I couldn't, we knew I couldn't stay. But baby, remember, I'll be back September and till then I'll write you every day. So he's committed, you know? And, and we're starting and, to run out of time. And I, I could just talk to you for hours about your stories and the lessons. And, and if nothing else, I, I want my listeners to really get this whole idea from your grandma, Tommy, of what you want, want you, and really how you've lived your life that way with the lessons your dad taught you about he didn't give you the answers. He just posed questions and helped you figure it out for yourself. I mean, what's next yep. for you? Well, I continue to do what I've always done. I answer the phone. People call and they have a project. I'm involved with Teen Cancer America now, which was started in England again. It was started, it still is over there, Teen Cancer Trust. It was started by Roger Daltrey. Okay. Uh, and uh, and it's a wonderful organization, and I haven't got time to talk about it now, but look, if you look up at teencancertrust.org, you okay. will see what they're doing. It's a beautiful thing. And then, uh, and because I work, we didn't really talk about Michael today, but I worked with Michael Jackson for 33 years and uh, had a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, creative relationship with him. Uh, the most fantastic artist I've ever worked with, human being. I mean, he was a genius in way more than music. Um, and I may have to have so, you back on to talk about that. And I know you wanted to share with people fun. how they could reach out to you before the show ended. Yeah, the easiest way to reach me, go to Facebook under Thomas Baylor, T-H-O-M-A-S-B-A-H-L-E-R. And you can, you can private... You can, you can, you know, what a direct message me there, or you can write me at my, at my, uh, I find that's the easiest way to get a hold of me is Baylor, B-A-H-L-E-R at me, Emma's and Mary is and Edward.com. Baylor at me.com or Facebook under Thomas Baylor. Just, uh, direct message me and ask me whatever question Perfect. you want. I love answering them. 
Thank you, Tommy. And you're about, you'll give answers on like your dad. So <laughs> thank you for being sure here will. with me today. And uh, remember, everybody, the right questions can change your life. I'm going to have to have Tommy back on because we've out of time. At it's all about the questions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 